Join us as we deep dive into the world of dentistry with Dr. Benjamin Hamm, dedicated dentist with over 40 years of experience and his right hand, Crystal Petty, dental hygienist. Discover the secrets behind creating beautiful smiles, the importance of oral hygiene, and how dentistry can positively impact lives. Welcome to Happiness on Tap podcast, where guests dive deep into the vulnerable experiences that contribute to their happiness. I'm Leanne Heron, certified health and life coach, owner of Finding Resilience with Leanne, and creator and host of this podcast. This episode is part of our health and wellness series. Thank you for joining us for Transforming Smiles and Lives, Insights from a Passionate Dental Team with Dr. Benjamin Hamm and Crystal Petty. Hello, Dr. Hamm and Crystal. Thank you for joining me today. How are you? My pleasure. I'm good. Good. Thank you. I, I appreciate you both. Dr. Benjamin Hamm graduated with his DDS from the University of Missouri, Kansas City in 1983. His undergraduate studies were at the University of New Mexico. He was doing his graduate work at the University of New Mexico when he decided to go to dental school. Having a general dentistry practice, he has worked for many years including helping evaluate transplant patients for various hospitals in the area. It is his pleasure to meet and work with patients of all ages. Over the past 40 years, he has volunteered for various organizations and has enjoyed his practice. His biggest joy, however, has been his wife and family in enjoying vacations, and watching the kids become adults. Crystal has been practicing dental, has been a practicing dental hygienist for over 20 years. She received her bachelor's degree in dental science from the University of New Mexico. Her initial plan was to do nursing school, but being that her mom was a dental hygienist, teeth were always important to her. She can honestly say she went to school for something she is passionate about and loves. She has been with her current dental practice and doctor for 17 years. She loves the doctor she works for as well as her patients. Dental hygiene is hard work on the body, but very rewarding. She has been able to be a single mom for 13 years and take good care of her son, as this career has flexible hours and great pay. On her downtime, she is with her son as much as a 16 year old will let you, but she's also enjoys going to the gym and hiking with her two dogs. She promotes dental hygiene and overall health daily. She loves a happy, healthy smile. So as you've probably guessed, Crystal is my hygienist and Dr. Ham is my dentist. And I have been with them since 2019 and always have such a pleasurable experience in my visits for my cleanings. So we're gonna start with some questions for Dr. Ham and then we'll move on to Crystal and then we're gonna have some general oral hygiene. So Dr. Ham, can you share with us your journey from undergraduate studies to becoming a dentist and what motivated you to pursue a career in dentistry? I took a real convoluted path to get here actually. I started off um, taking the MCAT, the going to medical school and scored very well and decided that was not my path because I wanted, I knew eventually I wanted a family and medicine, the people I had spoken with and people I had interactions with, medicine was a, uh, you were married to medicine first, not family. So then I pers was pursuing my uh, 
master's degree in botany of all things and uh, realized not to sound mercenary, um, not many opportunities in botany other than the forest service, stuff like that. And again, I wanted to raise a family and I kind of wanted to get into the health sciences. So I explored dentistry and it gave me the benefits of being able to be in a medical field and having semi-regular hours. And then I would be able to spend time with, at the time, not my family, but with my family now. So it was an interesting path that I took to get here. Wow. Um, how did your graduate work at the University of New Mexico contribute to your decision to attend dental school? Mostly because I realized um, I was working with the Forest Service and I realized that I love the sciences. I didn't want to live like a pauper. <laughs> and so I went into dentistry. <laughs> wow. Um, and that's it's wonderful that you, you know, were able to really put all that into consideration for your long term goals. Mm -hmm. you know, not just the immediate, not just the money, not just all those things, but that you knew that family was your long term goal and providing right. for your family and enjoying what you do. That's right. So as a general dentist, you worked in various areas of dentistry. Can you elaborate on the different roles or responsibilities you've had throughout your career? Well, that's the beauty of being a general dentist. I've gotten to uh, explore many different areas. Uh, when I come to work any one day, I don't come in with a stamp saying I'm going to do only this all day. I come in and I may get to see a child. I may get to see an older individual. I may get to see uh, a yuppie or somebody who has no money. Um, I see people who will need a root canal, a crown, a filling. Um, so I get to explore all the different avenues of, of dentistry, and that's been the hold on me. Some people like to specialize, and I had actually looked into uh, going into oral surgery, but I decided it was time to get on out of school, and, and I enjoyed the taking care of everybody in different areas. I know that when I'm, you know, sitting in a chair, um, I can hear the conversations, not in particular what's going on, but I can hear people talking to you. I can hear the joy in their voice or their concern in their voice or their fear. Um, and at, at the same time, I can hear you being reassuring, explaining, being compassionate and caring. Um, and I appreciate that, you know, as I'm sitting in the chair, I appreciate hearing those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Um, taking somebody and Crystal's real integral in that as well. Um, uh, you said she's my right hand. She's also one of my family members. She's, uh, uh, I, I couldn't carry on without her, to be honest with you. But um, I kiddingly say to people that I'm a dentist Crystal's a hygienist, hygienist, and we're also a part-time bartender and psychologist mm -hmm. because we listen to everybody. We listen to what they need. Um, she and I both try to have a very empathetic ear for people because we know it's real for people. And so we like to put on those different hats. And I appreciate that. I know that, um, you know, when I first talked to you um, as I was graduating and getting my certification as a health and life coach and kind of talked to you briefly about being a referral partner, that that was the connection that I was drawn to mm -hmm. um, and kind of connecting the possibility um, that you may hear something from one of your patients that, you know, you could easily refer them to someone else to kind of help them work through those things because we all need help in some way or another. And just being seen and heard um, and acknowledged is, is helpful to people when they're 
you know, in a pretty low state or they're struggling. And so I appreciate you and, and that empathetic ear that you both have. And you definitely are both therapists in that, in that regard. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's true. So I didn't know about your evaluating transplant patients. What can you tell me about that? Well, um, it started Presbyterian Hospital years ago used to um, do heart transplants. And they had a very active transplant program. In a nutshell, uh, several of the surgeons uh, were my patients. And they um, had a gentleman who the second transplant they did um, went south very quickly. And they had all of their systems people come in and take a look at them, at him and say, you know, well, no, he's not kidneys are fine. This is fine. That's fine. And finally, one of them called me and said, Hey, Ben, would you be willing to come down and take a look? And so I went down there and he had an abscess tooth and pulled the tooth in the hospital. And, uh, two days later he walked out of the hospital. Fine. So that's when they got on board saying, you know what, we have all these systems folks that take a look at the patient prior to transplant. Um, we need a dentist. And so they included me. And uh, that's how I got on board initially in transplants. And then I got on with UNMH and Loveless because they were doing different transplants. I still evaluate um livers, lungs, and uh, and kidney transplant patients um, because they're, those are currently referred pretty much out of state around here. We still see a large number of kidney transplants, but the livers and the lungs are definitely out of state now. And no more heart transplants in the state, but I still evaluate those patients as needed for out-of-state hospitals. Wow, that is, that's an incredible yeah. story. And Kind of another reason why I invited you both here for this podcast was I had um, a friend with a kind of a similar situation. He was having really, really horrible bad health and went in for an MRI. And at some point, that's where they caught that he had an abscess tooth. Mm -hmm. And so they we like, see that frequently. And they, in fact, they call the mouth the window to the body. And so we're often first in, in being able to uh, see somebody's poor health. It, it, it exhibits in the mouth frequently. Crystal catches it all the time. But people don't associate their mouth with their health. That's part of the problem. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know? Again, another reason why I invited you to here, because I think <laughs> it's it's stuff that we don't always think about. It's stuff that people don't. You know, it's just kind of at the back of our minds. Um, and as I've done my own health journey, um, it really becomes more and more, you know, evident the whole body care. It's not just the brain. It's not just mental health. It's not just physical health. It's not just gut health. It's the whole body and how even, you know, an infection in your mouth can affect your brain, can affect your heart. And so I'm looking forward to getting into more details about that. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, we evaluate patients all the time prior to um, knee replacement surgery, shoulder replacement surgery, um, again, some heart procedures. Um, so it's, pretty varied what we get involved with. And is that something that a doctor then refers people and suggests that they get their oral hygiene checked out prior to major surgery? Correct. Ah, Correct. good to know. Yeah, in fact, often, uh, in fact, they will generally send a form over and, and, uh, and on it will state are there any procedures that must be done prior to knee replacement surgery? Because crystal clank can't clean their teeth for six months after the knee has been replaced. And so we have a, a timeline we need to follow and the surgeon needs to follow. 
interesting learn something new every day <laughs> <laughs> so over the past 40 years dentistry has evolved significantly i know what i've seen just myself as a patient in x-rays and you know all different kinds of things what are some of the notable changes or advancements that you both have witnessed in the field and how has it influenced your practice? <laughs> how long is the list? 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll narrow well, that down. Maybe the last yeah. 10. <laughs> you, you mentioned x-rays. Yeah. Um, gone are the days of the big arm swing and swinging out of the wall and, uh, the film going in and us going in and developing the x-ray for seven or eight minutes. Now we used, um, we use uh, sensors that pick up the x-ray in about, oh, a millisecond. We have handheld x-ray unit now. We walk into the room and we can, it's like Star Trek. We just, and when it's done, um, the radiation exposure is incredibly small now. Um, uh, 30 films now is less than a day normal background radiation. Mm -hmm. And we never take 30 films. Mm -hmm. So that's, x-rays are a monster, don't you think? Yes. Um, yeah, it was something I noticed immediately. Like, oh, this yeah. is different. I like this. Yeah. When did this change? <laughs> we pick it up just like that. Um, we you can, go ahead. Dental materials are your big difference for both yeah, years. Denim, a lot of that has changed. Um, no more silver fillings. Those are gone. Um, people were worried about the mercury in that, although that's negligible. Um, but we don't use metal fillings anymore. Crowns are different materials now. Um, the dental education we have to keep up with. We take more hours than we care to, to think about. <laughs> Um, implants, of course. Um, I took the, my first course in how to place dental implants 37, eight years ago at UCLA. And, uh, and it's just leaps and bounds. It's changed amazing amounts. So, uh, the list is incredibly long. Um, what else do you, can you think of off the top of your head? Yeah. Just that. yeah. Well, her cleaning materials, yeah. what she uses for uh, uh, the old um, ultrasonic cleaners were like waterboarding somebody <laughs> and making them speak. Um, now she could get in there and it's very minimal. light. Yeah, it's minimal water. And and she uses a real, real light touch to get around and clean it all. So lots of lots of improvements. Yeah, I think um, a couple of visits back, I had talked to Crystal about silver fillings because it was something that had come up in part of my education and learning. And so she explained the change in that. Um, so. Yeah, they uh, they were trying to get rid of those. Um, well, when even when I was in dental school and uh, um, the mercury exposure. And what they don't tell you is, is one of the largest exposures to mercury you get is when you take the filling out. So you want to, there's specialty things that we do for that. It was kind of like, like back in the 70s, 80s and into the 90s when they were worried about getting the asbestos out of all the ceilings and stuff. And then mm -hmm. they came back and went, oh, if we leave it, it's harmless. Leave it. Yep, but when you start no messing problem. with it and all the dust comes into the air, the and I think she did, she explained that that to yeah. me, like the special equipment that's have, have to be used to protect people because of that. Yep. So you have a better chance of getting mercury in your system if you eat a lot of fish. <laughs> Which I don't do, <laughs> so I have to take supplements. <laughs> So thank you so much. We're going to jump over to, to Crystal now. <laughs> we'll come back to you. Don't worry. <laughs> so Crystal, can you share your journey from initially planning on going to nursing school and how your mom really influenced that decision for you? 
Yeah, I kind of always wanted to be a nurse. But like Doc said, you think of the medical field, the hours are crazy. They're long hours. Thinking of working overnight shifts, you know, especially being a new nurse. Um, so I applied to UNM's nursing school and their dental hygiene school. Their dental hygiene school only accepts 24 people. So I assumed I wouldn't get in. And so I would do nursing, but somehow I got in the first try. And so I just knew I was destined to do it. And my mom being a hygienist, teeth were always very important to me. And I had a lot of dental issues growing up. I had, I wore braces for six years. I had jaw surgery because I had an underbite. So I kind of lived around dental offices my whole life. And so it kind of just made sense. And I want to teach people how to take care of their teeth and not take them for granted because I had such a hard start to it, I guess. So yeah, it was meant to be. Absolutely. And you know, if we take time to acknowledge our history and our experiences and how those things influence our decisions for going forward um, and how we can help people. I mean, it's kind of the same as what kind of got me over to coaching and away from working in the legal field. Because in the legal field, I honestly wasn't helping anybody but my attorney. Um, and so this gives me an opportunity to help people in a way where I can share my experiences in my past, as well as the education that I've learned to make their life better or to save them time, money, heartache, you know, just to help them get somewhere faster with less stress. Right. I want to jump in real quickly because she's going to be modest she's um she said i don't know how i got in or i couldn't believe it she's an incredibly intelligent lady and my office since i've been in practice i've only had women who work for me who have a bachelor of science in dental hygiene they're not just these pushed out hygienists that are coming out of schools left and right so she is a Bachelor of Science in Dental Hygiene, and that means she's she's educated exceptionally well. She diagnoses um, illnesses. Uh, the list goes on. She's modest. <laughs> she's a smart lady. Yeah, it was like lady. nursing school. It was definitely like nursing school she yeah. went through. <laughs> so, Crystal... Um, being with your current dental practice and doctor for 17 years, that's amazing. But you know, I see Dr. Ham and you two are such an incredible team together. What are some of the key factors that contributed to your long-term commitment to the practice? Well, it's definitely Dr. Ham. You know, you got to have a boss that, you know, is great to work with, doesn't micromanage and trust in your skills. You know, a lot of these dentists, some of them, they teach you like you're, they treat you like you're still in school. They go back over and make sure you did your job. And I didn't like any of that. And doc trusts us that we do good work and that makes a huge difference, you know, and that he believes in our skills. Absolutely. And then the patients have just been great. You know, you bond and you build relationships with patients over the years and you know about their family and their kids and it's just it's like one big family you know you also um kind of touched on you know being a single parent and that this career has given you the ability to be a single parent and to provide and to be there when you need to be and that's the other thing about Dr. Ham. If I've needed more hours, he can give me more hours. If I needed less hours, he would let me have a day off. Like he was very understanding having a small child. And, you know, and that was a big deal. You know, your kid's sick. Yeah, go home and take care of your child. Or, hey, I need more hours this week. Is that okay? We'd add more hours. So it's that's, been great. Yeah. And that is so valuable and things that... Uh, not everybody looks at the big picture of value in the career they're considering. Right. Um, and so that is definitely one working for somebody that also has kids that understands um, and is not just going to 
treat you as a part, a cog in the wheel, your family. And I can, you know, I can see that. I can feel it when I'm there. Um, well, a lot of these other offices that are like corporates, they're corporations, they're a business. You know, you go in there and you got to make them lots of money. You don't have any relationship with your coworkers or your boss. You're just there to make money. And if your kid's sick and you got to leave, you're going to get fired. Like, it's just different working for, you know, a sole practitioner. Absolutely. I know that I've talked with both of you about this. Um, and I want to touch on the physically demanding part of what you both do and how you make changes and how, like, uh, I think Dr. Ham pointed out the chairs that you have um, sitting differently. So if you guys could touch on that. We all joke that in dentistry, everybody has one a different body part that hurts. And you can ask all four of us in the office and all four of us have a different body part. Mine's my neck. The other hygienist, it's her shoulder. The other hygienist, it's her knee. Um, Mine's my back. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's just the nature of the business. You know, you try to you try to hold a good posture. Um, that's why we got the chairs a couple of years ago that for these guys. It's 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 a saddle chair. Great for them, not for me. <laughs> it's got because it's shaped like a saddle and it forces your back to sit straight, but it hits me in a wrong spot. <laughs> so, <laughs> not that great for me, but uh, it's just the nature of the beast. You know, when I went to school, you'd see all the old dentists walking down the hall and they all walked like this, like Igor. Mm -hmm. And that's because they stood and looked upside down. We sit in chairs now and we're bent over. Yeah. Backs and necks, you know, so you just compensate and try to try to do the best you can. <laughs> and now we all wear loops that magnify everything. Mm -hmm. So you're not so bent yeah. over. Mm -hmm. That's really helped. And that's changed with hy dental hygiene. Now the dental hygiene school requires the students to actually buy loops and wear loops. And so I would agree. I've been wearing them 17 years. So I couldn't do my job without them. Well, so it's good to know that. Thing. Yeah, it's really good to know that the school is also considering the long-term physical effects mm -hmm. this career has. They on. said on average, a dental hygienist doesn't make it past ten years. Like that's the longevity of our job, and I would agree. I know a bunch of girls I went to school with; they were done by ten years. So. And I know you're real physically active and I'm sure that yeah, I, helps as well. Yeah, I definitely do the gym five days a week. And then I see my chiropractor every three months just for routine checkup. Yeah, maintenance. Yeah, she irritates me. <laughs> <laughs> I try to get him to go to the gym. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I can imagine how that conversation goes. <laughs> so what are some rewarding experiences or moments that you've had um, that you can just share a little story? Well, I had one today. I've had a patient. He's gosh, he's maybe been a patient five years now. He was going to lose quite a few teeth and hadn't had his teeth cleaned in years and was going to lose teeth left and right. And so I worked very hard to get him back into health. He's lost a few teeth and had to have some implants done, but he'd always come in still not using a water pick, not brushing his teeth, you know, not going home and really doing what he needs to do on his part, having me work really hard, you know. And a, he came in and it's the best I've seen his mouth. He's finally taking care of himself. He's understanding how hard I worked because I see him three, four times a year. And it was like all of a sudden it clicked. And just to see that and to see that my hard work's finally paid off and he realizes he can save his teeth and have better health. Like, And he's just one of many. So it's just that it's great. Finally, when it clicks, you know, you finally are a good team together. Mm hmm that to me is worth it. Yeah, absolutely. Keep somebody out of 
keep somebody out of dentures and teach them how to take care of their teeth at home. Yep. Absolutely. So what advice would you give to an aspiring dental hygienist who's considering this career path? I mean, it's, it's been a great career for me and I, I'm, there's great opportunities. It's changed a lot in the sense that dentistry has moved towards corporate. A lot of it's corporate businesses now. So you're going to be kind of, so you, you could still find it, you know, sole practitioners, but it's a different business now. So it's worth it. You make great money. You have great hours. Um, you just got to find your perfect office and your perfect boss, but it is hard work and it's very physically demanding. And I think if you know that going in, it'll be, fine. but I say do it. Great advice and great to know um, because I, I know I have a friend who it works with an orthodontic office and they went corporate and she has been absolutely miserable since day one. It yeah, has just been awful. a battle of wills, a battle of care. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I definitely don't recommend it if you can avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but like Doc said, a lot of these new dentists are coming out of dental school really high in debt. And so they can't open up their own practice like his generation did. And so they're having to go work for these corporations to make the money back. And it just becomes a money maker. And it, it's not my cup of tea, mm -hmm. but and it that's is, kind of where it's going. Yeah. It's right up there with the rest of the medical field. You know, it's, yeah. it's not health care. Uh, you know, you're limited my, to how long you get with a doctor. They don't see you as a whole body or a whole person. They're just, uh, you know, it, it's a quick visit to see how they can either write you a prescription or refer you out. Yep. Yep. So let's jump over to um, oral hygiene because that is really the, the big picture here and why I wanted both of you. Um, why is oral hygiene so important for overall health and well being? And how does it go beyond just having a bright smile? Well, you think of how much bacteria is in your mouth. They say there's like 3,000 strands, but only 10 of them are bad. But all that bacteria in your mouth and you're not going to keep it clean and, you know, food and it just, it, if you have all that bacteria, it gets into your bloodstream and where else is it going to go? It's going to go to all your other vital organs. And it just, it's crazy to me that people don't associate the bacteria in your mouth as not being bad and not removing it every day. And this would be an, a two hour talk just yeah. in itself. <laughs> um, because um, see it every day. we see it all the time. And it's one of those things where the, the research over the last 10 to 15 years, oral bacteria and heart health is a huge connection. Um, oral bacteria, uh, abscesses getting into the brain. Um, a kid died when I was in dental school that uh, I had seen on the, we called it pain chair. And the parents brought him in and, and shipped him across the street to the hospital right then and there. Got to the hospital. Two days later, I walked across to see him in the oral surgery clinic, see how he was doing. He was gone, eight years old. So it's so important for people to to pay attention to the the cues and the signals and and uh, yeah I mean it's just we we're the first ones to see oral cancers. Mm -hmm. We just had a lady about two months ago lost half of her tongue that we found it diagnosed it sent her over, but she's alive, you know. So it's one of those things where people really need to keep their oral health up. And to me, it's so simple. Brush your teeth twice a day, floss your teeth once a day, you know, use a water pick. We're not asking you to diet and exercise or do anything <laughs> drastic. It's simple and it takes less than five minutes of your day. Good habits. And see your dentist twice a year. Yeah. 
whoever they are. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you for bringing up the oral bacteria and heart health. Um, because I do have a friend who ended up with a, an abscess underneath a crown. Um, and then all of a sudden she had dramatic weight loss. Um, and they're finally looking at like all of her blood work and her blood work is almost more consistent with like a parasite. Uh, but mm. now that you mention bacteria and heart health because a lot of her blood work is showing now issues with her heart or potential issues with her heart. Um, it kind of makes me wonder how much more of a connection there was between those two things or is. Well, bacterial endocarditis, um, bacteria lodging out on the heart valves is huge. Mm -hmm. And that's when you go in and have to have your valve replaced. Um, again, uh, seeing all the patients, the heart patients on a press for years, um, had a kid, he and his girlfriend one night having a flossing race just for fun, 23 years old. And I'm walking by and I'm like, gosh, what's wrong with him it's in the heart floor? And he, that little race in bacteria, he had a mitral valve prolapse, bacteria got on it, destroyed the heart valve, heart valve replacement, 23. So you never know, you know. It's important. It's bacteria. Follow up. It's important. Um, well, these things all kind of connect con connect together. Um, systemic health and how neglecting oral hygiene can impact other body parts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's simple: livers, kidneys, hearts, lungs, brain all have a bacterial connection. And if you get bacteria into your system, you don't know where it's gonna lodge. So it's important to keep up with. Or if people let abscesses go and they don't treat them with either a root canal or having a tooth extracted, your body's constantly fighting that infection and protecting itself from that infection where it's neglecting the rest of the body, you know, because it's constantly on fight or flight because you have an active infection that you're don't treat and so it's a big deal to get it treated people yeah. would never catch pneumonia and leave it untreated for months at a time but they will an but abscess. they will an abscess tooth crazy oh, crazy <laughs> <laughs> what are some other common health issues that can arise from poor oral hygiene practices I think we covered the majority. Diabetes is a big one. If you're diabetic and you don't treat the bacteria in your mouth, you lose teeth, you have infections. Um, you know, that's a big thing. They like if you get diagnosed with diabetes, they tell you go see your dentist because you know, the sugars in your mouth, it feeds the bacteria in your mouth. And so they kind of have a heyday and you know. You lose more teeth, you have more gum disease problems. So diabetes is a big one with your oral health. Wow, thank you for bringing that up, Crystal. That is one I hadn't considered, um, but I think I'm paying more attention now that there are so many commercials uh, like Jardians, you know, that people are taking uh, for diabetes and the risks associated with those medications because of the high level of sugar in the system. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's just, it, it's interesting and something I, you know, I've had both my um, ex-husband and my dad were diabetic. My dad, um, we lost him to, to diabetes and alcohol. Uh, but those are the things you, you know, I didn't know as a kid when I was thinking I could take care of my dad and his diabetes by controlling his diet and all these other things, but there's still so many pieces that you just don't know. And so, you know, I, I appreciate you guys speaking to those things and bringing them to the forefront to, for people to, to pay attention. Yeah. Well, the other big thing too is, is we get referrals all the time and uh, encourage people to ask their docs is the uh, bone replacement therapies, Boniva, that sort of thing, uh, with they've got um, osteoporosis. Riddle, uh, yeah, osteoporosis problems. 
and there's uh, there's a necrosis that can develop just spontaneous. And uh, so you need to have good oral health so that doesn't happen. Jaws will spontaneously create a big necrotic jaw just for no reason. And oral health is the best thing to keep that from happening. Thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Well, so the other thing for good oral health is pregnancy. Mm -hmm. That when you're pregnant, you need to be very diligent in keeping your teeth clean, seeing your dentist, because it can cause all sorts of issues with your pregnancy. And it can even cause early term um, birth and low weight babies. So and women will notice it. They'll say, well, my gums are bleeding. They're sore. And a lot of times it's when they have poor oral health and then they're pregnant. And so their body's protecting this baby. Well, they're protecting the baby from all that bacteria in their mouth. And so during pregnancy, you really have to up your oral hygiene game. And another great one. <laughs> <laughs> Throw them out there if they come up, because those are those are great things for people to to consider. Yeah. How about um, preventative oral health, like tooth decay and the risks associated with untreated cavities or potential complications? Well, there again, you're talking about the decay eventually becoming an abscess, and then you've got a bigger problem. Um, to be honest with you, tooth decay has gone down in our armamentaria because it's it's becoming less prevalent than it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, the cavity prone years have actually changed. It used to be when we were kids and now we're looking at the middle late 20s because the kids are not getting to the dentist. They're tired. They don't take as good a care as they used to and mom's not there to hat and nag at them. So that's where we're seeing the increase in tooth decay. Our biggest worry though is tooth loss and that's um, eight out of every 10 teeth lost is due to perio or periodontal disease. And uh, that's what Crystal has to be after people all the time to try and maintain their oral health so they don't lose bone and lose teeth. Yeah, we're definitely being as many cavities as we used to mm -hmm. it has That's gone good. down it is good but it or you'll see it in really elderly generation because they take medications that cause dry mouth and so they start getting a lot of decay at the spine and that's just because they don't have their saliva moving stuff around as well anymore so we still see it a lot in the elderly hmm all interesting stuff that I <laughs> never had a clue. <laughs> You're my education for today. I appreciate you. So you mentioned that sometimes you see a patient that doesn't have money, doesn't have insurance. How do you, how do you deal with that within your practice? That's a tough one. Um, because I don't take, um, uh... Medicaid. Medicaid anymore, um, because jumping through the hoops um, is too much. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, I volunteered 14 years at a children's clinic in Santa Fe, and that was helpful until that closed down. Um, we'll see people on a case-by-case -case basis, like a family member. Somebody comes in and asks if we take Medicaid, and we'll say, no, we don't. What's the, what's the story? And we'll hear it. We'll take them in and see them. Um, get them out of pain, get them out of hurt. Um, case by case, um, there's a lot of practices out there that are dedicated to Medicaid. A um, little tough sometimes, but if people have money, we usually can find a way to help them mm -hmm. somehow. I appreciate that. Okay. I'm there are a lot of offices that work with Medicaid, you know, and that if they're able to get state assistance and get on the Medicaid, you know, a lot of times they'll help them fix their teeth or things. But like Doc said, he'll get them out of pain and then kind of get them in that right direction where they can get state assistance or they do have low income dental clinics that you can go to and they, they do it based on income and stuff like that. 
Yeah, I know that uh, my daughter does that as well because she's never really had the best uh, dental insurance as an adult. Um, but at least she's taking care of her teeth. So I'm happy to know that she's at least making those appointments. Um, yes. I know that when um, I had to get my crown recently, even with dental insurance, I was a bit shocked when it was like $1,200. I was like, oh, well, I'm glad I had that money. You know, I'm glad I had that ability. Um, but, you know, sometimes I think there's people that like, I tried to plan for dental care when I didn't have insurance, at least enough to cover my cleanings. So I would try to budget, you know, I'd reach out to my dentist and say, okay, how much does it cost for a cleaning and x-rays? What do I need done? So I could budget away that money um, so that I could continue with my dental care, but not everybody has that ability. Yeah, it's hard. And uh, again, case by case, we'll work with people. Um, um, unfortunately, we've got people who um, take advantage of it, huh? Mm -hmm. You know, so like if we, something, the crown example, um, can we, can I pay you $25 a month? Oh, geez. Well, we've yeah. got, we've got a monster set of expense on our end mm -hmm. that we can't eat, you know, but so it's case by case. And, uh, and I learned a long time ago, don't judge a book by its cover because some people, oral health is very important to them and they will find a way mm -hmm. to get it taken care of. And the reverse is true. They've got the means and they don't give a hoot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and that is a really strong point for a lot of things. Same with coaching, same with people getting mental health care, uh, same with their diet. You know, if it's important to you, you will find a way. Amen. Yep. Yep. So we'll, We'll end it here. What are some tips, you know, your basic standard tips that you can provide to listeners about maintaining good oral hygiene habits and preventing oral health problems? Well, like you said, habits, make it a habit. First thing you do when you wake up, brush your teeth. First thing before bed, brush your teeth, you know, or brush after lunch. Or I tell people, you don't have to floss after you brush. Floss in the car, floss, put floss by your bed, put floss, you know, when you're watching TV, you know, just make it a habit, make it a routine. Or you can brush in the shower, you know, but it's important. But yeah, you just need to make it a routine. Once it's a routine, it's not a big deal. And then go to your dentist twice a year. I mean, people go get haircuts all the time. They go get their eyebrows done or their eyelashes or anything like just make it go twice a year. See your dentist. You know, you got to prioritize it. Yep. Absolutely. And saying, I know. Go ahead. I was going to say the old saying mm -hmm. is you only brush and floss the teeth you want to keep. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I, I appreciate <laughs> that was a great way to, to tie this up because that is so important. So tell us where people can find you. Well, our office is on 4101 Morris Northeast. I'm in Sweet G upstairs. We're on the southwest corner of morris and montgomery caddy corner from dion's and our phone number is 505-312-7888 and we do have a website and we are on facebook so wonderful under I dr will, i will include all of that information in the show notes so hopefully we can get uh you know more people interested in coming to check you guys out because you're wonderful and I appreciate you. And um, like I said, I, I get to find out now that I started publishing this out, the the amount of people in Albuquerque who've been seeing Dr. Hammond for years. That's 40. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Not a different color hair then. Yeah. 
<laughs> Didn't we all? That's why I colored mine. <laughs> so thank you both. It has been an absolute pleasure. I have learned a lot today. I hope my listeners also have learned a lot. Um, if you enjoy this interview, please make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, Finding Resilience with Leanne. Happiness on Tap podcast is available on YouTube and Spotify, Amazon Music and Audible. For more information, check out my website, Finding Resilience with Leanne, and make sure you subscribe to my email tribe to be kept updated with all exclusive promotions, new products, up and coming amazing podcast guests like Dr. Cam and Crystal. So thank you. Thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Appreciate you you taking this time. And now you can say that you have not only done your first Zoom, but you have you have also been on a podcast. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) See, 40 years you're still learning new things. I'm still learning. (laughs) (laughs) We'll see you guys soon. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. you.